Well, turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 27. You know, something that is difficult for young people to really truly understand, and those of us who are older and have kids, we totally understand this, and that it's helping people understand the value of something. Right? Because the, the challenge is, is that when, when something is given to somebody, when they're young, right, your kids, they just like destroy and demolish their toys. Now, on the one hand, they're like flat playing with it. You know what I mean? They are like making it happen. I mean, they're like taking trucks and, you know, they're not messing around. Like, I remember I would have these uh, G.I. Joes and whatnot, and I would like pop the legs off to like, you know, simulate like somebody, you know, uh, going through, you know, war and all this kind of stuff. You know what I mean? My son having his transformers and they were just like pieces all over the place. You know what I mean? Uh, I think I'm still finding uh, my, 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 I got my son, this was a few years ago, a master chief. Some of you know what I'm talking about. And uh, all that's left of the dude is literally his torso, his head. And then like, I'll like move a couch or like be vacuuming and all of a sudden there'll be an arm and and then all of a sudden there'll be, a, you know what I mean, all these kind of things. What's really sad is when you start doing that stuff with Legos. Because then you, you pop off that little hand thing, you know what I mean, right? But on the one hand, it's good that they're playing with them. And I, and I, and I like that, hey, they're getting their use out of it. But on the other hand, do they truly understand the value of what they have if they didn't pay for it? The reality is that there's no better illustration in the life of a disciple about how much we value what Jesus has done than the way that we live our lives as disciples. And I don't think we can truly appreciate the cost of discipleship unless we truly reflect on the life of Christ. Why do you think we have people, when we're studying the Bible with them, hey, start with the book of John. Like, see what this Jesus has done for you. You know, as often said, Jesus never, ever asks us to do something that he himself was not willing to do. Not just willing to do, but gave us an example of what to do. And if there's anything in the life of Christ that shows this cost, it's the cross. Everything in life, everything in the life of Christ pointed to the cross. That was its culmination, at least initially. And then everything moved on to the resurrection. But this is why I love the cross study so much. I love that we do the cross study with people to help them really, truly understand what happened on the cross. You know, if you grew up in a Christian home or even in a religious home, or just we just flat grew up in America, under Judeo-Christian values, we all have grown up with this idea that Jesus died on the cross for sins. Okay, cool. Check. Move on. But if you're like me, you never really understood it in its entirety, in its realness, until you took a look at it for yourself in the scriptures and saw what really happened to understand its impact. You know, one of the big things that we learn in the cross Uh, The cross study is that the cross of Christ is not unique in the one sense that everybody, like tons of people died on crosses back then. The Roman soldiers, you look at them sideways, they throw you up on a cross. So in that regard, the fact that Jesus died on a cross isn't what makes the cross unique, but because Jesus died on the cross, it is altogether unique. Go to Matthew 27. The reason why it's unique is because it had a singular purpose. And that was the purpose of restoring you and me, restoring man's relationship to God for those who respond to the grace of the cross. And I remember the first time I read this account and I heard these words of Jesus while he was on the cross, Matthew 27, verse 45, from noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in that afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, I never really understood what was happening here. I thought maybe, you know, all his homies like left him. So maybe he was feeling a little lonely. But, you know, maybe because of, you know, as as many of us feel when we're in pain, like, okay, God, where are you? (laughs) You know? 
but I never really understood the spiritual implications of this statement until I really studied the Bible. The reality of that statement is that at that moment in time, God, Jesus' Father, turned his back on him. Why? Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 says, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor is ear too dull to hear, but your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Literally, we've stiff-armed God. We've pushed him away because of the way that we've tried to live our lives, our own way, our own sinful way, and we're the ones that caused this. Our sin separated us from God. Equally, our sin also separated Christ from his God, Christ from his Father. That's what happened on the cross. Jesus was free from sin. He lived a perfect life. So why would God then turn his back? Well, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says, For God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God's. The only reason why you and I are not punted into the sun, are not flicked like a bug by God in heaven, is because of Christ's sacrifice for you and for me on the cross. That's it. And yet many of us, we arrogantly walk around thinking we're good. We arrogantly walk around thinking we're fine. We arrogantly walk around thinking that everything's okay. No, it's not. You and I killed Jesus. And because he willingly took that on the cross, God is begging you and begging me for the chance to have a reconciled relationship. Isaiah 53, verse 4 through 6 says, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus suffered separation from God, separation from his father for the first time in his life. And it hurt him so bad that the longest phrase he gives on the cross is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This was the greatest pain. But you know what's interesting is us as disciples, we have the same choice. Our choice is to take up that same cross. Luke 9, 23, then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. This is where the reality of pop culture Christianity, this is, this is the reality that they will never teach. Because the moment you start talking about pain, the moment you start talking about a, a, a sacrifice, the moment you start talking about something, unless it's with money, this is where they go, we're gonna lose members. We're going to lose people. And so we don't want to go there. We will never be able to follow Christ unless we pick up our cross. But what's cool about suffering as a Christian is that suffering has a purpose. Go to Romans chapter 5. Every one of us are going to suffer in this life. Every one of us have suffered in this life to varying degrees. But the reason why suffering as a Christian is altogether different is because there is a purpose behind the suffering. Yeah. Romans 5 verse 3, it says, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. That sounds just nuts. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. The first reason why Jesus wants us to pick up our cross is because suffering produces change in our lives. This is why so many people in our culture today, when we go through suffering, we automatically respond with medication. We automatically respond with sin of many, many kinds. Pick your poison, drugs, alcohol, sexual morality, impurity. 
Maybe it's Netflix, maybe it's YouTube, maybe it's social media, whatever it may be. We veg out, we check out, we numb out in whatever way we choose. So instead of going through the suffering, what happens? We don't change. This is why you could be a 40 year old man and still have the mentality of a 13 year old kid. This is why men after men after men after men crumble under the pressure of their lives when they get families and kids and a real job. That's why so many younger generations still live in the basement of their family's home. Instead of getting a real job, going and, and actually making some, something of themselves. Because they can't handle it. And the reason why they can't handle it is they've grown up in a generation of medicators instead of a generation of perseverers. That's not the Christian life. That's not the kind of men I'm trying to build here in this church. It's not the kind of man I'm trying to be. It's not the kind of man I'm trying to help my son to be. And it's not the kind of men we're trying to help the young people, the young men in this church to be either. The Bible says we should rejoice in our sufferings, not because of the sufferings in themselves. Yeah, sweet, I'm suffering. Woohoo! No, but because there's a purpose. There's a purpose of which perseverance brings about, and that's character. A character that allows us to become convinced that God is working in our lives. There's a purpose behind our suffering, and that gives us hope. Hope that Christ's love compels us. You know, many people don't want to suffer. We were studying the Bible with a guy on Friday. And uh, we've kind of gone back and forth a little bit uh, over, over text. And it's been a couple times where it's like, hey, man, looking forward to getting together today. Ghost. Wow. Get together. At, supposed to get together at 9 on campus. It's 9.30, 9.45, 10 o'clock. Finally responds. Oh, I'm so sorry, man. I slept in. Like, somebody does that once. I mean, the guy's 18. No big deal. You know what I mean? I get it. You know what I mean? I get it. I'll give the dude the benefit of the doubt. But like twice, three times, now you're wasting my time. Now, now you're, you're wasting my time that I could spend helping other people. And so we're talking with him and he's just like, yeah, I'm just, I feel unmotivated. I just feel lazy. I just, you know, I feel really down about it. And I'm like, he should feel down about it. It's terrible, man. It's terrible. He's like, what? Now, why, now, I don't talk like that to everybody. I don't talk like that to everybody, but a couple conversations ago, he let me know he lost his dad back about 10 years ago. The dude's 18, 10 years was eight. Has he grown up with a father figure in his life to teach him masculinity, to teach him how to persevere, to teach him to go undergo suffering and do something in his life? No. So I'm not down on the guy, but I got to be pops. I got to be dad. And I got to lay it down. And he goes, you know what? You're right. I need a father figure. I was like, no, you don't. You need Jesus Amen. and a father figure in that order. <laughs> and that's what the kingdom provides. We see this again with Jesus again and again and again. The character of Christ, you see change in your life when you take it on. And you're more convinced of the character of Christ in your life. Suffering produces change. Saul, the great persecutor of the church. He had to go through suffering too, Acts 9, 15, and 16. Write that down. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to go before the people of Israel. Now, if the, if the story paused there, that's like, wow, this dude gets to preach the word before kings? Wow. That's awesome. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Is the end of that sentence. God wanted to show Paul that heaven is going to cost him something. This is not that we have to work in order to get to heaven. We don't have a works-based righteousness. But let me tell you something. If you're truly saved, you're going to work. If you're truly saved, you're going to operate as if you're working. You're going to be a worker. But we do not fully appreciate the value of something until we understand the cost. Suffering is part of the Christian life so that the world can be won to Christ. Colossians 1 24. Now I rejoice in what I'm suffering for you and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, the church. 
Now, in no way is Paul saying here that somehow Jesus' sacrifice wasn't finished. In fact, Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. So it is finished. But what he's saying is that I need to suffer so that you see Christ's afflictions in me. So that you will become convinced that how we believe and what we believe is real. Anyone can be a disciple in good times. Anyone can say yes to Jesus when things are good. But when you're under pressure, when you're under the gun, will you still say Jesus is Lord? Are you in or are you out? We see this with Peter and the apostles. We see that in their lives, all all but one of them, Judas died a martyr's death, or not a martyr's death, Judas died a persecutor's death. He, he killed himself. So you had 11 faithful apostles. Out of the 11, you had 10 that died martyr's deaths. 10 that went on to preach the word and died gruesome, horrific death. Peter saw his wife crucified, and because he saw Jesus and his wife crucified, he asked if he could get crucified upside down. And on and on and on and on it goes. People do not die for a lie. They were convinced. When people saw the suffering that they endured for the sake of that conviction, I'm sure that they were convinced because they saw how convinced these men and women were. We will never be able to get the message out to this lost world, not to mention the city of Fresno, if you and I are not convinced this way as well. So today... We're going to dive into the cross of this or the cost of discipleship. Today we're going to dive into the cost of discipleship. That's the title of the lesson this morning, the cost of discipleship. There's a fundamental truth in the Christian life and that fundamental truth is this, no pain, no gain, no cross, no crown. No pain, no gain, no cross, no crown. The first cross that you and I as disciples of Jesus have to take up is the cross of service. Go to Mark chapter 10. The cross of service. Mark chapter 10. You know, earlier in this chapter, we see James and John. And uh, what's funny is they come up to Jesus and say, Hey, Jesus, uh, we got a favor to ask. Will you, will you say yes before I ask the favor? And Jesus is a smart guy, so he says, Well, what's the favor? And he goes, uh, when you come into your kingdom, can one of us sit at your right and one of, you sit at, one of us sit at your left? Now, here's what's crazy about that. Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God. So one of them was asking to be put between God and Jesus. You know, what's crazy is that Jesus never condemns them for the request. Now, he puts it on them. He goes, all right, can you handle what I'm going to handle? Yeah, we can do anything. Ah, it's like, it's like you're going to go through it, buddies. Mark chapter 10, verse 41, it says, when the 10 heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus calls us to a life of service. We find an argument here about who's going to be the greatest. But in the midst of this passage, we fail to see and appreciate the fact that Jesus actually wants us to do something great. He actually wants us to be great. Oh, but, you know, we're we're so, like, indoctrinated with the Catholic religion of like flog yourself if you want to do anything great for God or, or, or like hurt yourself or, oh my gosh, I have such bad motives or, oh my, like Satan just like punches us over and over and over again when we want to do something great for God. But Jesus wants us to do something great. He says, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. But he says, you got to be great you, you, you need to be great. You need to strive for greatness, but you got to do it in the way that's right. And that way is as a servant. Why? Because even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus calls people to greatness in his kingdom. Jesus does not want mediocrity. Jesus does not want us just to be good, just to be better. 
He wants us to be great for his cause. And I see so many Christian lives, when, when people make the decision to follow Christ, they have these awesome worldly dreams and they just kick them to the curb and live a life of mediocrity where they have no dreams. They have all this ambition. I'm going to do this. I'm going to be a brain surgeon. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And then they come into the kingdom and it's like, I can't do any of that. Well, why not? Why not? Now, to, to be sure, life is going to be a lot harder for you. You want to do something great in the world and something great in the kingdom? Well, that's awesome. We need great men and women who strive to do great things in this world and in the kingdom. We need to strive to be ambitious, to desire to do great things for God. But we need to do so by being a servant. I really believe that if we as Christians can put back into our hearts this desire to do great things by serving others, people are going to be drawn to Christ in our lives. Being servants, yes, doing good deeds, but ultimately being servants is laying down your life, taking on the afflictions of Christ, taking on what is lacking in Christ's afflictions, laying down your life so that other people can see Christ in your life and to be drawn to Christ himself and his word. I'm convinced that Jesus was the greatest in the kingdom of God, of course. And he calls you and I to do the same. Maybe not to sit on his right and his left, but just being in the presence of the great makes us even greater. The greatest thing that you and I can do in the kingdom of God is to work. Matthew 9, 27, he says to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. But you know, even on top of that, I think the even greater need isn't just for workers, but for leaders of the workers. I mean, think about who are the leaders? Who should be the leaders? Maybe I'll put it that way. The world has got a bit of a different idea of what a leader should be. But who should be the leaders in the kingdom? Isn't it those who, by example of their own lives, have worked hard? have become effective and fruitful in their lives? The hardest and most fruitful and effective workers, those are the leaders. Ezekiel 22, verse 30, God says, I looked for someone among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so that I would not have to destroy it, but I found no one. God is looking for men and women who would rise up to greatness in his kingdom and to do great things, not just people doing, going into the ministry. We all should be striving for greatness in the kingdom of God. Every single one of us needs to have a heart and an attitude that says, here am I, send me. I'm going to stand in the gap. I want to make a difference. See a need for myself and the church to rise up and become great. We need teenagers to rise up and stand in the gap for their fellow teens. We need college students to rise up and stand in the gap for their fellow students. We need professionals to rise up and stand in the gap for their coworkers and friends. You know, it was awesome. Val brought one of her coworkers out to, uh, to Wednesday memory. It was awesome. Now she came to a pretty juicy lesson, but I saw her and she was kind of nodding and smiling and like and you know what I mean? That's always a good sign when somebody comes in, you know, and they're like hard and tough, you know what I mean? And then they come and kind of soften up by the end. It's awesome. She's got a conviction. She's got a heart for her coworkers. We need more seasoned men and women to stand in the gap for this generation to become shepherds and deacons. We need more hard workers in the church. We need more servants of God. We need people who are willing to stand in the gap. Judges 5 verse 2 says, When the leaders take the lead, then and when the people willingly offer themselves, praise the Lord. This is what we need. Not just Ariel and I to stand in the gap. Not just the Bible talk leaders. Not just those that disciple other people, but all of us to stand in the gap, willing to take up the cross of service. Remember, no pain, no gain, no cross, no crown. Go to Matthew chapter 8. The second cross I want to talk about this morning is the cross of fatigue. The cross of fatigue. You can imagine being a servant, pouring yourself out day in and day out. It's going to be tiring. It's going to be tiring. Matthew chapter 8, verse 23 
It says, then he got into a boat and his disciples followed him. Suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat, but Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him saying, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. He replied, you have little faith. Why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. We see that the disciples of Jesus are in the small little fishing boat in the middle of the lake. Squall hits. It's crazy. It's nuts. Waves are coming all of us. And there's Jesus just in the bow of the boat, just chilling, just sleeping. You ever, you ever knocked out like that? You ever knocked out like that? Like just boom, like roommates trying to wake you up. Man, I've been shaking you for an hour. What's going on? My kids are like that, especially my son, man. Like I could wake him up and he could be totally awake and then poof. <clears throat> trying to get him up before school. Yeah, Akaya's the same way. I know she's back there laughing, but she's the same way. I wish I could, but I'm an incredibly light sleeper. Last night, about three o'clock in the morning, all I heard was woof. And I'm like, whoa, what's going on? Now, some of that's like I'm a dad, you know, like I'm a man, you know what I mean? I'm like, all right, I'm, a, I'm vigilant, you know what I'm saying? All the crazy stuff going on in this world, man, I'm vigilant. I got my, I've got my baseball bat right next to my bed, man. I'm ready to go. That's the only weapon I got, but I'll do it. You know what I mean? I've even thought like coming in, those of you that have been to my house, we have this little landing. Our, our master bedroom is upstairs and I have this little landing. I thought like, what if somebody's like walking into, they can't see me because I'm kind of chill. You know what I mean? I'm like a, like a tiger about ready to pounce. You know what I mean? And he's walking right next to the, and about ready to go underneath the threshold there for, to get to my kid's room. And I just like, Boom! It just bounce on him, you know what I mean? And just pummel him, you know? And then it's Ariel, you know what I mean? Like, uh -huh. But we see Jesus was a hard worker. So of course he's exhausted. I mean, you read back before what happened. He's meeting needs. He's waking up early, meeting need after need after need after need. And in order to get his spiritual energy, he's got to wake up early. Mark chapter 1, verse 35, very early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went to a solitary place where he prayed. Certainly, if there was anyone who knew the cross of fatigue, it was Jesus. You know, many times when people are trying to make the decision to follow Jesus, one of the big detractors is the schedule. Wait, 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 you mean I can't just go wherever I want, whenever I want, and do whatever I want, whenever I want? But you can, like, nobody's stopping you. Can't say that it's righteous though. To be a disciple is a consuming commitment. Why? Because it's no longer you at the center of your life. God is at the center of your life. And when you say Jesus is Lord, that means you're not. And so before I'm a student, I'm a disciple. Before I'm a, an employee, I'm a disciple. Even before I'm a pastor, I'm a disciple. God rules my life. God reigns in my life. And so where he tells me to go, I go. Where he tells me to stay, I stay. What he wants me to do, I do. That's the end of it. There's no negotiation. We, like, we're bending our lives backwards for work. Boss calls you, hey, I need you to come in early. Okay, boss. Hey, I need you to stay late. Okay, boss, no problem. But yet when God calls you to do it, somehow now we've got to like hop around, well, I mean, but yeah, it's, no, Jesus is Lord's. And so this creates a bit of a pull, a bit of a tug of war in our hearts for God. The early church was devoted to a full schedule. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone as they had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. Every day they met together at the temple courts. Some of us have a hard time eating three days a week. They... Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God, enjoying the favor of all the people. The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. That's Acts 2, 42 to 47. You know, if we are to restore New Testament Christianity in this generation, in this city, we've got to be committed, like them, 
to a lifestyle that often creates fatigue. What usually tends to happen is when we feel this fatigue, we begin to ask the question, well, well, can I keep this commitment? That's the wrong question. The right question is, what do I need to do in order to keep this commitment? Because chances are you have to change your priorities. You have to change your schedule. Not bend your schedule, actually change it. You know, this is something that Emma knows full well. She lives up in Merced. And you know what she did this weekend? She came down on Friday and spent the entire weekend with disciples. Why? Because she understands where she needs to be. She understands where her heart is going to get filled. Do you think that's easy? Our sister's household is already pretty crowded. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I have another per- like it's a party, but you know what I mean? It's a it's a it's a tight squeeze party, you know what I mean? So the right question is to have the heart to want to keep the commitment because of what Christ has done in his commitment going through his fatigue for you and for me on the cross. I think this is one of the core issues, again, of many of people who gather for church is because we do not see an immense commitment that Jesus has made for us. We're not grateful for that commitment, and we see it as an optional activity. And our want is lacking. My brothers and sisters, this has got to change. If you want to be with the family of God enough to follow the extraordinary example of Jesus' commitment, as in the first century, there's something deeply troubling in our hearts, and we got to choose to repent and get back to a heart that's close to God. Here's the cool thing, is that in this life, we will be strengthened if we do what God calls us to do. 2 Chronicles 16.9, this is a wonderful promise. For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. What does that mean? That means on the one hand, God's going to strengthen me when I'm fully committed, but if I'm fully committed, God's going to strengthen me. Where does it end? Where does it begin? Who knows? Does it begin with my commitment and then God's strength, or does God give me strength and I'm committed? Yes. We got to do both. It's a beautiful cycle. God gives us strength when we're fully committed and fuels us for what's ahead. You know, if I'm honest, I feel this tug of war on a regular basis. I can go and I can crank out a ministry. Ariel and I can go and be on campus all day and and share our faith all day and study the Bible with people all day. But then what does that leave out in the open? The family. So I can, okay, well, and I can be with the family all day and I can hang with Ariel all day and we can get all of our dishes done and get all the laundry done and make sure they have a clean house and all the things. But then what typically falls by the wayside? The ministry. And so there's this constant tug of war. But what does it require? It requires more faith. It requires more obedience to God. You know, I'm an introvert by nature. I know that doesn't seem like it. I'm up here, you know, hollering, screaming, jumping up and down. But I'm an introvert. And so preaching five, six times a week, being, pouring myself out with people and their problems and their situations and the things that are going on in their lives and really giving my heart and really pouring myself out, I come home, I'm exhausted. I often get worn down mentally and emotionally from dealing with these things. It's gotten so bad at times that after I'm done preaching or something, I just want to go home. You guys ever felt that? Like, you just like, man, I just, I love you all, but I'm out. The, 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 the singles in the campus know, know a phrase that I say at the end of our family time. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. Can't stay here. You know what I mean? At some point, I just got to go, all right, guys, let's, 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 let's be done. Amen? Amen? There's a great quote by Vince Lombardi, a football coach, and he says, fatigue makes cowards of us all. Wow. I believe this with all my heart. Fatigue makes us lesser men and women. We can choose to be lesser or we can pick up our cross of fatigue, deal with the temptation for laziness that comes when we start to grow tired. 
In my life, I believe this to be true, that most cases of tiredness are mental. If we really enjoy a movie, we're going to, it doesn't matter that we're tired. If we really enjoy the company of someone, it doesn't matter what we're tired. We'll move things around. We'll even, even if we've had a long day or feel physically tired, but when it comes to church, somehow we find all kinds of reasons. When it comes to disciples, we find all these kinds of reasons. And I'm not saying that not all of them are legitimate. But we've got to check our hearts. We've got to check our hearts. James chapter 1. Go to James chapter 1, look here in verse 12. We have to understand that the grace of God, and by the grace of God, we will put ourselves through anything and push through anything to pour ourselves out. We can be motivated to love and give and serve even when we are tired because we are motivated by the cross of Christ. And here's the good news. With the cross of fatigue comes the crown of life. James 1.22 says, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. Having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. The one who perseveres under the cross of fatigue receives the crown of life. Remember, no pain, no gain. No cross, no crown. The third cross is the cross of criticism. Go to John 12. John chapter 12, look here at verse 32, or uh, 42, excuse me. John 12, 42, yet at the same time, many even among the leaders believed in him, meaning the religious leaders. But because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith or for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue, for they loved human praise more than the praise from God. Are we more concerned with the praise of man than the praise of God? You know, that will be seen in how you live your life. That'll be seen in the little tiny choices that you make for righteousness or wickedness. Do you obey man or do you obey God? If you're more concerned about getting along with everyone around you, then you will never be able to carry the cross of criticism. You know, early on, this happened about April. You know, it's one thing to be working full time and kind of doing ministry full time. You get a little bit of a shield. Because when people ask you, hey, what do you do for a living? You're like, oh, well, I work for Meta, you know, learning and development consultant for, for, for Facebook, blah, blah, blah. And I, and I pastor a church, right? It kind of lessens the blow. But now being a full-time minister, it's like, what do you do for a living? Uh, I, I, I pastor a church. Oh, okay, okay. And most people are pretty nice about it. Every once in a while I get the side eye, you know, everything, the stink eye, you know. But I was legitimately concerned about what people thought of me. You know, we were having a little discipling time with Jay the other day. And he's like, hey, man, did you know, like, because most of the time in the persecution study, I kind of go, hey, like, we're too young for people to, like, really write articles about us and stuff like this. You know what I mean? Like, we're making some waves on campus, but we're not making enough waves that we're getting a whole lot of persecution. You know what I mean? Like, like bad persecution. And, uh, and he said, hey, man, like, did you know that, that, like, people are talking about us on Reddit? Now, the, the looks on your faces tell me that who cares? <laughs> Like weirdos are on Reddit, you know what I mean? Like or something like that, you know what I mean? Like y'all don't even know where, where Reddit is, you know what I mean? Uh, so who cares? But I go on there and I type in Fresno ICC, and what pops up was a video of a guy that I studied the Bible with, and he happened to record the lesson. He recorded the Bible study. Now he didn't get my permission at all to do so. And, and he, I mean, if you listen to it, it's ridiculous. The guy was just off his rocker. He would not let me turn to scripture. He wouldn't pray with me. He, he like kept asking me like, well, show me in the Bible where it says this. And I would go, okay, well, turn here, turn here. Well, I already know those scriptures. Well, then why are you asking? <laughs> but it was funny to kind of feel the difference of my heart posture. The very thing that I was afraid was going to happen. The criticism of men actually happened. And I was... I was ticked off, to be honest, because the dude, you know, recorded me without my permission. But then I was like, nah, this is, this is hilarious. This is kind of cool, you know? But the reality is there will be those who are critical of you. 2 Timothy 3.12 says, in fact, so this is a fact. You can take it to the bank. 
everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. You can have one of two reactions. You can become bitter and resentful and go back at them, or you can respond like Jesus. What was Jesus' response to the people on the cross? I mean, literally, he's on the cross dying. He's in pain. He's in agony, separated from God. And they look at him and go, hey, you saved other people, man. Why don't you save yourself? Even the, even the, the, the uh, robbers who were next to him were like, hey, man, you saved others. Save us. Take us down from the cross, too. We need to understand is that you and I are on a cross, too, and we cannot come down. We cannot come down. We cannot lower our standard. During times of criticism, we need to realize that the temptation to compromise is the greatest. The chances of us being tempted to lower our standard is at risk. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. The Bible says in verse 23, Do not have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know that they produce quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents he must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape the trap of the devil who has taken them to do his will. When we deal with people, we cannot quarrel. We cannot argue with them. We must be humble with people so that they will want to see the truth. People will see our hearts of humility. They'll see our hearts of love for them. Now, this doesn't mean we just lie down and take it, right? But there's a way in which you respond to those who are criticizing us that is like Jesus, that's loving, that's godly. Then they will see that you are genuinely trying to follow Jesus and take up that cross of criticism. It's tough to be sure, but we find Paul gives us a great admonition later on in 2 Timothy chapter 4. He says, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering. 2 Timothy 4 verse 6. And the time of my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness. What the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not only me, but also all who have longed for his appearing. When you carry the cross of criticism, you also get a crown of righteousness. No pain, no gain. No cross, no crown. Our second to the last cross is the cross of loneliness. Stay there in 2 Timothy. We find that Jesus experienced this in Matthew 26 where he's going to the Garden of Gethsemane, getting his heart right for the cross, and he comes back and he finds his guys, his best friends, sleeping on him. They can't stay awake. He's beating his chest. He's, you know, sweating drops of blood. And, and all the guys can do is fall asleep. And then we just talked about Jesus being separated from God. Paul experienced the same loneliness. We just read his final admonition to Timothy, his son in the faith. But if you keep going, 2 Timothy 4, verse 9, it says, Do your best to come to me quickly. For Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Christmas has gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful for me in my ministry. I mean, you read this, you can feel the pain and agony that this man is in. Paul, who has done so much for so many people, but only Luke is there with him. Keep going, look in verse 14. Alexander, the metal worker, did me a great deal of harm. He, the Lord, will repay him for what he has done. You too should be on your guard against him because he strongly opposed our message. And my first defense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them. For the Lord stood by my side and gave me strength so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed to all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely into his kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Paul was lonely. It says here that at his first defense, nobody came to his defense. He was flying solo in court. There wasn't one single disciple who would stand up with him. You know, people often ask, well, why do you guys go to San Francisco all the time? You know why? Because I need it. We need it. We're literally only three hours away. We need it. Well, why do we have to have a, 
you know, a, 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 you know, a, a winter workshop? Why do we have to go to San Francisco for our winter? Why? Because you need it. I need it. I need to build as many close relationships as I possibly can in California right here, right now. Because when we go to Alaska, guys, it's a six-day drive. It's a six-hour flight. It's a three-hour flight to the nearest church. We will be on our own. And we need these relationships. Why? Because all of us will bear the cross of loneliness. But ultimately, we do need brothers and sisters to be with us. And I believe that we've got a group here in the Thrive family of churches in Northern California, and indeed all over the world, where we will come to each other's defense. We will stand in the gap for one another. But ultimately, even if we don't, we have to have the heart of Paul that ultimately we got to understand we might be alone in person, but we were never alone with God. The Lord is always standing by us and will deliver us from the lion's mouth. Every Christian who strives to do great things for the kingdom will carry the cross of loneliness. The only way to deal with this cross is to develop and deepen your own personal relationship with God. This will make all the difference when we know that God personally cares about us, that he's standing with us, not just through the cross of loneliness, but all the crosses that we are to bear. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone aim running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. We must look to our own relationship with God. Are we running in such a way as to get the prize? Paul had this conviction. He wanted to make sure that after he preached to other people, he himself would make it to heaven. We can preach to other people all day long. We can share our faith. We can invite people to church. We can say the Bible with hundreds and hundreds and thousands and thousands of people. But in the end, if we don't have a great relationship with God, we're not going to make it. What point is that? What good is it if we're able to help thousands make it to heaven, but we ourselves do not? My brothers and sisters, I want to call you as I'm calling myself these last two months of the year to double down on your quiet times. If you're not having them, repent. You will not last. If you are not getting time with God on a daily basis, you will not last. I guarantee it. The only reason why I've been able to be faithful for 24 years is because I've had a daily time with God. It might have been terrible, but at least it was something. And you know what? If you miss a day, amen, don't beat yourself up. Don't let Satan beat you down. Wake up the next morning and have it. Or better yet, be convicted to stay up a little later and get that time with God. Don't put your head on the pillow until you get that. Read more, pray more, dig deeper so that you will not be disqualified. When we do this, we will receive a crown that will last forever. When we do what? When we don't give up. When we keep the good fight. When we keep the faith. When we finish the race. Remember, no pain, no gain. No cross, no crown. The final cross to bear is the cross of pressure. 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 23. Are they servants of Christ? I'm out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. I always get a kick out of that. I say this every time I read this passage. That word pelted, that's like a little rock. And I just say, pfft. And it's boom. Uh, what? No, homie got like thro rocks thrown at him, like stoned to death. And literally, church history says that the disciples, they are gathered around him and laid their hands on him, prayed for him, and he popped up. And yet he just kind of, yeah, I got pelted with stones once. You know what I mean? 
Three times I was shipwrecked, spent a night and day in the open sea. I've constantly been on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger in sea, in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and have gotten, often gone without food. I've been cold and naked besides everything else. I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin and did not inwardly burn? Paul endured so much suffering for the cause of Christ. And yet the thing that weighed on him the most was the daily pressure he felt, the daily concern that he had for the churches. 2 Corinthians 11, who is weak? Verse 29, and I'm not weak. Who is led into sin and I do not inwardly burn? Have you ever found out that a disciple in your life is not doing good? When someone doesn't show up to church or when a brother or sister on campus and they, they walk by you and they don't say hi, you know something's up. Or when they do and it's kind of like, just like, yeah, yeah, okay, man. they got that long face. You can feel it. It just rips you apart. I feel weak inside. I burn inside. I feel personally in my own family. Again, I was talking to the staff the other day about the need for them to put urgency in the people that we study the Bible with. Because people become disciples when Ariel and I hop into the studies, but if it's just, and I'm like, I, I can't be the one that, that, that is in there all the time. You, you guys got to do it. You guys got to get in there and help these people become disciples. We don't believe in just the pastor does the work here. That's not how he operates. But there's this tug of war between my family and the ministry, my family and the ministry. I, I could help a million people become disciples and my own family doesn't make it. Is that worth it? But you know what's cool? Is that God's giving me the opportunity right now to figure out that equilibrium. What does that look like? How does that feel? What is the right amount of time here and the right amount of time here? But I feel this pressure in my life. The pressure with how my own personal family ministry is doing and balancing that with how the church is doing, how you all are doing. You know what? This morning, as I got here, I prayed that each and every one of you would feel the same pressure. Yeah. I prayed for you to feel pressure. This is why this is the last one, because, you know, servants, right? Yeah. Amen. I'm building you up to this, right? If we all felt the same pressure that Paul had, the same pressure that Ariel and I feel, I think we would see a much different church before us this morning. I think that we would see a much different approach to how we take care and love and serve and give to one another in this lost world. But not just the pressure for the church, but yes, that pressure for that lost world. Turn on the news. I think too many of us live in this microscopic world that is just us, just me. And we don't really think about what's going on outside of this world. Politics aside, socioeconomics aside, geopolitical movements aside, this world is jacked up. Why? Because you and I are jacked up. And this world needs Christ. They don't have it. You know, the more and more I study the Bible with people here in Fresno, the more and more I feel pressure for those that are stuck in false religion that are stuck with this, these weird, wonky religious ideas that really don't help anybody live a powerful life. The Bible calls it a form of godliness, but denying its power in 2 Timothy 3. We have got to feel the pressure. We've got to carry the cross of pressure. If we do not, they have no hope. They have no chance. The world needs Jesus Christ. We must feel the pressure of world evangelism. But the world starts right outside our door. The world starts right outside your door, right outside your college class, right outside the door to your office. We need to have a vision. Our mission is simply to go and make disciples. Whether they go or not is God's thing, not us. It's God's deal. Our job is to simply go and make disciples. We have a choice this morning on whether or not we will take up the cross of pressure. 
We have a choice this morning on whether we'll take up the cross of Christ or not. And yet when we do, when we do take up the cross of Christ, when we do take up this cross of pressure, there will be a crown. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. We'll wrap up here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19. The Bible says, For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and our joy. Paul says, what is our hope? What is our joy? What is our crown? Is it not you? We will glory in those who we bring to heaven with us. That is our glory. That is our joy. That is our crown. It's other people that we've been able to impact for the cause of Christ. I wish with all my heart that people would be able to understand the joy that is ours in Christ when we live out our purpose. Because it's when we have this purpose in our life that life begins to take meaning for God. You know, as I've said before many times, we fail to share with those we study with how great this purpose is. This is what makes all these crosses that we carry, this is what makes them make sense. This is what gives them meaning. The ability to touch people's lives and have a great impact on them. But we have to remember, if we're going to be disciples of Christ, there is a cost. Where there is no pain, there is no gain. Where there is no cross, there is no crown. This morning, I want you to reflect on your life. I want you to think very seriously. Have you followed through on your commitment to Christ? Don't automatically say yes. Think about it. Pray about it. Reflect on it. Have you been living out the purpose that he has for you? Have you been carrying your crosses? If you have not, you have a wonderful opportunity here this morning to get open with a brother or sister, to ask God's forgiveness, to repent, and get back on the right path for the Lord. To be able to pick back up your crosses and follow Jesus. Or maybe you've never made this kind of commitment to Christ. Maybe you're like, holy cow, you serious? Well, there's more to it. There's more to it. And you have an opportunity here this morning to, in the person that invited you here, to get into a Bible study. To dig into more about what this, this passion, what this energy, what this emphasis, what these crosses, this life of a disciple is all about. So you too can know the cost of discipleship, but not just the cost. And we'll get to this tomorrow, our, our next Sunday. But also the rewards of discipleship. I love you very much. Let's pray for communion.